it is quite an honor to be invited to this meeting and uh, especially so uh, in this discussion about epifora which is uh, one of my uh, interests uh, i have very keen interest on the management of epifora mainly because uh, this is one of the areas which gives you uh, people a lot of uh, trouble and uh, needs a lot of understanding for you to do the right thing. So it's a great honor to be here and uh, to be part of this uh, presentation and more so even to be in the same forum for uh, some of you who have, uh, we have trained at the University of Nairobi. Uh, some, of the, some of you have been our colleagues at the university when we are training. So I'm very happy and glad to be in the, in the meeting. So without uh, further ado, I think uh, we can go ahead and listen to the presentation. Dr. Fred, you can proceed and share the slide. Yeah, please, can you unmute yourself, uh, Dr. Fred? Dr. Fred? I want to remove this thing. Okay. Uh, good good evening to everyone. Today we are going to see uh, or to discuss together about the resolution of congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction with non-surgical management. And today it's Kitwe Teaching Hospital, Kitwe Zambia, OST, and the presenter is myself, Dr. Freddy Mobiai, with my team here together in Kitwe, Registrar in Ophthalmology. Uh, this journal was published in June 2012, and it, it have an impact fa factor Excuse me, Dr. Fred. It, yes. It, we, we, we can't see your slides. Please, could you share your slides? Go, go down there, the icons down there, find the share screen. Okay. You, you find the share screen icon, it's, it's in green, and then click it. Yes. So uh, find your slides, the PowerPoint slides. Sure. Yes, so just 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 click the function F. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you may proceed, please. Okay. Today uh it's Kitwe hosting the 60th journal club for Zos Zambia. And I'm the presenter, Dr. Mubiai, and uh, my co-moderator is Dr. Nyeze from the Kenya University. And uh, today we are going to discuss about the resolution of congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction with non-surgical management. This, it was published by the ARC uh, Epidemiology in the JAMA Ophthalmology. And the journal is have an impact factor of three. And uh, before we start discussing our journal, I wanted to bring a, a small recap about the lacrimal duct obstruction, uh, or in general, the lacrimal duct. 
And the lacrimal duct is a common ocular condition in infants. And 20% of neonates, they are always been affected with epiphora. And among these 20%, 95, the resolution is always spontaneous within the first year. And there is no sex predilection. And the next slide is just showing how the lacrimal sac anatomy is presented, where we are having the two canaliculars, punctum, uh, the lacrimal sac, the nalosacrimal duct, and where the valve of Ashna is located, where mostly the congenital obstruction happens. How to diagnose, to diagnose clinically uh, obstruction? First thing is, um, point number one is to identify epiphora. It is Epiphora and matting of lashes, what may be constant or intermittent. Also, in uh, our office, we can uh, on the lacrimal sac, and you're going to have, see some purulent uh, discharge coming from the punctum. And also, we must always make a difference and to detect if there is any diagnosis, what is not uncommon all the time. And uh, the evaluation of epiphora, it always starts by examining the lacrimal duct, and most of all, Mostly, this uh, examination it was done under microscope, so that we be able to see how the punctum is positioned and the eyelid. It's, it is here to note that the punctum is always lie on the eyeball, and when we see any misalignment like a entropion, anthropion, or any scar, it might lead also to lacrimation. And also, we can do also palpation of the lacrimal sac, but we're going to see down in the slide how we can proceed to do the lacrimal sac palpation. Also, another mean we can do the furious disappearing test. And uh, I'll explain with the slide coming down. We can also do the probing irrigation, John Dye test. But here, I just want to mention that uh, with the contribution of our co-moderator, Dr. Nienze, say, for most oculoplastic surgeon, they are no longer using this John's Dye test. And also, you can go to imaging, where we can do the nuclear lacrimal scintigraphy and the contrast that your cystography. And these two slides, it's showing the one on our right side, it's showing how you can examine the punctum. This punctum and how to see the eyelid is the way it's positioning. You can use here the microscope so that you can be sure to see if the punctum is lying on the eyeball or not, or if there's any anthropion, what's contributing to The tearing. And the other slide on the left side, it's uh, we use the fluorescent, what we put into the, if uh, they die into yellowish, means that uh, tears, they are going onto the cheek. If the tears not going onto the cheek and remain in the eye, this one is just uh, water in eye. This is the way we can uh, talk about the fluorescent dye test. And also, we are having the canaliculus palpation. The canaliculus palpation is use a probe of Bowman where we can just put on the punctum and as we try to lift up the, the area where the, 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 the area where the, the sac is located and the punctum so we can palpate with you if there is any fibrous tissue or if there is there any mass inside so that we can know what kind of blockages is uh, in in the pathway of, uh, of the, the lacrimal sac and duct. And also we can do irrigation by using the, uh, the cannula with uh, some normal saline, where we can just go to the back time and try to flush up and to see if there will be any regurgitation or if the fluid will just pass freely so that it can indicate if there is any obstruction. And also by going to probing, probing, Things that want to proceed, we need to have a dilator, which we supposed to insert it vertically by dilating the punctum, because when we look at the canaliculus, the way it's the anatomy, it always have the ampulla, what is uh, most vertically for two millimeters, and we must put it vertically and try to dilate. After dilation is where we are going to insert now. A probe, 
we start by the smallest size by trying to go slowly so that we can't disrupt the punctum in, in and it push in. It's well now we're laterally so that we can try to push into the canal lucullus. This one can be done inferiorly or superiorly so that we can check if the integrity is there or it is free. And uh, when we are using the probe, we can have two outcomes. And the first outcome, it can be what we call uh, ad stop. Ad stop is where the probe just pass freely and reach the nasal bone. And when we reach the nasal bone, we say that we have achieved the, the ad stop. And this one, it meant that the canalic glass is free. And from there, we can also flip it and uh, go downward vertically, laterally. If we can go and meet the obstruction down, downward at the level of the valve of Ashna, where most of the congenital blockages happen. And uh, this is just the illustration of uh, the soft stop. The soft stop is when, as you are pushing horizontally your probe, and you find there is a, there is a, a resistance, what is on the, the fleshy tissues. And this one, it just meant that the canaliculus, there is a blockage at the level of the canaliculus, and uh, we must address the issue at that, that place. These are the type of probe I wanted just to share. The probe the, of, the, of Bowman's, how they are looking like. The smallest downward up to the bigger one, zero up to 10. But you can have all those numbers so that it can help dilating according to the, the estimation as you are doing your surgery. And uh, on top there, we are having the lacrimal cannula and the punctal dilate the way they are looking. This is just to illustrate which instrument we need to use when we supposed to undergo any dilatation. And uh, this pictorial, this picture is coming, this slide. Um, this one, I, the way I said, uh, any benefits, especially when it comes to the trio uh, blockages. And here we're having John Dye 1 and John Dye 2. And uh, the John Dye 1, the positive test is just as we use um, the fluorescent dye, we are going to use uh, um, a cotton bud where we're going to put in the nostril. If it is, uh, um, it can be, it's going to be colored by the yellow color according to the fluorescent, we're going to do that this test is positive. But if we are not seeing any uh, draining tears by colorating the dye into on the, on the, on the, on the cotton bud, we're going to say the, the test is negative. This, Jones 2 is just to illustrate if there is any partial blockages where we're going to use the cannula and uh, as follows, as I've explained by probing, you just push in the dye. And if you find the dye is coming down, you're going to see there's a partial blockages. And if nothing's coming out to polarize your body or putting in the nose, nose you're going to say that uh, it is uh, blocked. And uh, for the treatment, this algorithm is just to help us out to understand the way we can go about epiphora. Because for us to detect if there is any blockages, we need to have epiphora. And we must address and to check what is the, contribut the contribut contributory factors, what makes the eye to, to, have, to have this lacrimation or the tearing. And this has been devised in two, adult and children. In a child, what is our concern today? When we evaluate and find that there is a before we confirm it, fair things is to do a conservative management because according to the literature, 90% under one year with a simple massage. And uh, there's a persistence of these blockages after you have assessed with massage and antibiotics. It's where now you can try to go to surgery. And this surgery, it will be probing plus minus stenting or ballooning or, uh, and other management what you can go surgery. And if the stenting fell and the other probing, whatever you're going to do, is where you can decide to go and do DCR. But when there is a blockage in adult, you dilate and probe and it gets straightforward. And there, we are going to go to the other management, but our concern, it is about the children. After this, I would like to share some small videos, two videos, to show how we can undergo um, massage of the lacrimal sac and also 
how the probing can be done. I think this one is uh, the way how we can proceed to do our lacrimal duct massage. What the individual, they said it's better called compression of the, the sac. And uh, the next video is going to talk about how to do our probing. I think with these two techniques of massaging and um, and um, probing, I think it will, it's highlighting what we've been saying according to the management, because especially here, our journal, it was concerning to see how, um, which outcome do we have when you're using a non-surgical management in children and uh, at which stage the probing can be done. As we go back now to our journal, the objective, what was assigned, it was to determine how often nasolacrimal duct obstruction is always resolved without uh, a surgical man management for children aged six to less than a year, less than 10 months. And uh, the study setting, it was done, um, it was a multi-center studies by the group of pedig pedigree or pediatric ophthalmologists under supervision of the National Institute of Health of America. And the method what was assigned to do the study, it was multi-center multi randomized clinical trial. The ethical approval and consent, it was obtained. And then um, one zero patient 
entered into the study, and this it was about one thirty one hundred period of follow up of six months. Six months. It was a clinical examination to evaluate the outcome after the patient was uh, tasked to do uh, a massaging at home by the parent or uh, the, the the guardian. And the statistical tools what was used. It was a 95% co confidence interval, logistic regression, Poisson regression, multiple imputation, and generalized estimatic equ equation. Those are the tools what they used so that they can analyze the, the result. And uh, the inclusion criteria, it was uh, infant age six to less than 10 months, the onset of uh, symptom prior to six months of age, presence of at least one sign of nasolacrimal duct obstruction, absence of uh, upper respiratory tract infection and any other ocular condition, no prior surgery, and the exclusion criteria, it was a craniofacial abnormality, Down syndrome. That was the, the criteria what they used. And uh, in the result, the first result, what you are having here is a flowchart of a uh, the patient, those they undergone the observational period. What is just showing that here, that the 107 patient, those who entered, and the 133 eyes was assigned to be observed. At three months of phone calls, after the parent was called, um, the total of eyes what was asymptomatic at, at, six, at three months, it was 56. And uh, 72, they were symptomatic. Four, and uh, this one, it was due uh, worsening of the condition. And the other two, it was this, in the second month because of uh, there is a, it was a problem of uh, cellulitis. And one patient, the data was missing. And uh, at six months, what it was discovered that 38 eyes resolved without surgery and 10 wasn't. And uh, eight patient, the data was missing. And among those 72, those who had uh, symptoms, 38 resolved and 29 didn't resolve. And the five, the data were missing. And it was mentioned that the one who the data wasn't there, it also resolved at six months. And uh, this is the, 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 the chart showing the resolution of the nasolacrimal duct without surgery, the way it was explaining. At three months, it was 981 eyes. Those uh, phone calls were made. It was uh, 81 eyes for unilateral blockages. And uh, among the 81 patients, 39. The result was, uh, it, was uh, it has resolved. What was the 49 percent among the 89? And one, the way I said, one, the data was missing. And the it was also noted that among those people that they, they were called on the three months call, 29 had 26 had bilateral nasolacrimal duct blockages. And among those, as we saw down there, 35% of the eyes, those they are the bilateral, 35 percent resolved without surgery. And then one eye among those bilateral resolved also what was 8%. And the others, one, there were no resolution. This three months ago. And the other side, it's showing the six month post, um, the, the post, the, the, the randomized period. And here it was noted that the patient those they were seen, it was the total, it was uh, 77, whereby 44 patients, it, it was 92 eyes in total first, where 44 resolved, in, in, those they had unilateral blockages and the bilateral blockages, uh, 14 patients had uh, a resolution, and then one, five also, it resolved without surgery one eye and the six patient didn't 
have any resolution. But it's noted that this bilateral, when you are seeing the figures there, when you are talking about 14, it's, those, it's just the number of patients. But the number of IAs is 28. And what it means, a total of number of patients, what was seen at six months, it was 117 IAs, and the 77 patients were seen. And when we look at the, the result under there on the chart, it shows that but considering the 95 confidence index, what it was assigned, the all follow up at three months and the six months, it was lying in the confidence index. What was showing that at least the resolution was adequate when uh, massage it was. Done prior any surgery. The second check, the demographic and ethnicity. And here, uh, the risk, the real risk, what was, uh, was assigned according to the confidence interval, it was ranging, the difference, it was one. And as we see, as the way the chart is presenting, we're going to see that in, in generally, all there were no connection between the age, the sex, or the rest to the resolution. This how this uh, two table is presenting this. They analyze them, and as we compare, we're going to see that according to the age, according to the sex, according to the rest, there were no any correlation between uh, the resolution with this uh, demographic and uh, clinical characteristics, and how they author interpreted this result. They said that more, more of infant having the nasolacrimal duct obstruction, the infant, it was resolved for the patient less than one year. That it was the interpretation. It means that all infants less than a year, at least they had their resolution without surgery. And uh, to go into our critics, according to their, their methodology, what we have noted that the question it was it was defined, the study question was defined, the way they say it was a randomized was defined, but the period it was also given, but it wasn't clearly stated when it started, but it was just mentioned that six months of period for this study. But But they did set when, say when it started and where it ended. But they said at least they've entered the study for six months. It was that they could, they didn't include a control group where we can refer to to see if uh, uh, what they are presenting to us is very adequate. The control group wasn't mentioned. Maybe it was mentioned in the other study, but in this one it wasn't mentioned. And uh, the inclusion criteria and the exclusion was clearly defined, as uh, I said in the other slide. Uh, the assignment, it was done, as I said, it was a multicenter randomized clinical trial, and uh, there were no control group. They just went like that, but they didn't tell us how they go about it, how they made these groups. This is they didn't disclose, but in the table, we can see that they've grouped according to the age, according to the, the race, but they don't show us the way they went, they go about it. In the assessment, uh, the measurement of the outcome, they were appropriate, and they, it was addressing the study question. And also, the standardized protocol, what they used, I think there was also a need to have a clinical evaluation, so that the early clinical evaluation, example, maybe at three months, so that they can address if there, were, if there was any faulty technique, so that it can maybe, the result it can be higher than what we are having. And um, the statistical tools, what was used, it was appropriate. The way I said, those appropriate statistical tools, they used the, 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 the way a confidence index, what was addressed.
they were oh this one uh, poisson this all they were used just to do these tools were very very appropriate actually and for the other demographic and the other characteristics and this uh, statistical was very very appropriate at least to brought up a significance and also the result we are having here they've compared also with um, another study that was done by Paul, where they've analyzed uh, 36 eyes where 27 at the a at the year of 18 of 12 months there were all resolution and the confidence index it was uh, at 70 percent and this one it was well compared because this one is giving the same and the same meaning and uh, i can conquer that it was well compared and uh, it was so so well done and uh, for the interpretation we are going to see according to others what they did and the other so many studies what they it was done and it was it was just confirming even if we go to the literature it was just confirming that this study uh, the way it was it had uh, a prospective design this study to look like it's having a prospective design and by looking at the factors what they included there were so strong positive things what was showing that what they have done it was so were corrected and the studies it's just confirming that at six months and less than 10 months the resolution of uh, the obstruction is is going to be achieved and according to my extrapolation here i would just want to say that uh, the non-surgical management of uh, nasolacrimal duct obstruction Dr. Fred, we can't hear you. Dr. Fred, I think he's disconnected. It appears like he has bad connectivity. Yeah, could you please unmute yourself? Dr. Fred? Okay, it is done. I, I think he has done with the presentation. Can I go ahead and make my comments? Yes, please, Dr. Neze. It appears it's done. Yes, I just had a problem with uh, my internet to just interrupt again, but I've done. Okay, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I like the fact that you did not go directly to the journal paper. You tried to put a uh, as introduction to it. And that is the, ways, the, the, the right way to do a journal presentation, to put everything into context. Uh, having said that, uh, in, during your introduction, and this is where you need always to, to, to be careful, is that you mixed the two types of uh, epiphora during the presentation. And epiphora in a child is almost totally different than uh, epiphora in an adult, all the way from examination all the way to management. So let's go back to, let's get a patient with a congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction. Uh, let's say a child with epiphora, a neonate with a, or a baby with epiphora, or an infant for that matter. One of the things that most people do, and it is totally 
uh, generalization, which is very common with everybody, is that every epiphora is congenital on a solacrimal duct obstruction. Well, uh, it is, and, and in most textbooks, that is what they describe. But before you go there, it is always good to try and see whether there could be other ways. In this case, I mean, there are some kids or children who have a punctual atresia. And as an oculoplastic specialist, I get a lot of some referrals of a patient with, a, let's say, punctual atresia, and they are trying to, pro, uh, to massage. You see, it doesn't make sense at all because massaging is for patients who have purely nasolacrimal duct obstruction, and the nasolacrimal duct obstruction is a membranous obstruction at the valve of asthma. Uh, having said that, there are some other aspects that have not been uh, discussed, and those are probably the obstruction is not always that membranous. It could be even a bony obstruction, or it could also be just a stenosis, and that is something that we need to start uh, thinking about. Uh, when it comes to examination, of course, you have to try to look at the, because in a child you can't do much of probing unless they are under anesthesia, before you make that conclusion, just look at the punctum. It's very easy to, 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 to look at it. And if it's patent, chances are that you are dealing with the with a, with a nasolacrimal duct obstruction. Of course, common things appear more commonly, but if you rule, rule out a punctal atresia, then that is okay then you, it's, it's safe to assume it is a nasolacrimal duct obstruction. And you'll know it is probably something else if after probing, uh, it fails to, to go through when the proper probing is not uh, uh, successful. So what do you do with this child in terms of examination and they are unit and very young? Well, uh, these are the ones who benefit most from a dye disappearance test in case you want to know whether there is actual, actual epiphora or, or not. But apart from that, uh, there is nothing else. Of course, you mentioned about the position of the punctum to the eyeball. That is also very important to see. As in, you, ask, you have to, 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 to at least look at what you can see. Look at the tear leg, is it excessive? Uh, is there marginal tear film elevated? And of course, is there matted? And if there is a matted, uh, is there a discharge? And uh, finally, you do the pressure on the lacrimal sac. Some people say a uh, ROPLAS test because it, 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 you, you see if there is, if you get reflux on the pressure of a lacrimal sac, your diagnosis is, uh, is, uh, is certain that this is a nasal lacrimal, is not a punctal, is it is not a canalicular obstruction. So that is it for the examination. That's how you approach the examination in a child. The examination in adults, first of all, you have to rule out other excessive tearing because the fact that tears are passing down the cheek is not always uh, a certain way of saying that this is uh, obstructive tearing. Epiphora is excessive tearing, but we usually use the term epiphora to mean obstructive uh, tearing. So I'll go, when I say epiphora, I mean tearing because of obstruction. So is it due to excessive lacrimation because inflammation, allergy, all those kind of things? Or is it reflex tearing in a patient with a dry eye syndrome? Because dry eye syndrome is another cause of tearing, which is usually very tricky to explain to a patient who comes tearing and try to tell them your tearing is because of dryness. Uh, it's usually a very tricky explanation to make. When you rule out excessive lacrimation or reflex tearing in dry eye syndrome, then you go and start looking at where could the obstruction be? Uh, uh, not obstruction B, is there a real epiphora? Uh, then this is where you look at the marginal tear leg. That is where you look at the, uh, I mean the tear leg, the marginal tear fill, and then you go directly and look at the puncture. You rightly said, is it opposed to the eyeball? And then if it's opposed, is it stenosed or is it blocked? Those are things that you can check before you can do even much. And this, the punctal issues, you can look at the slip lamp. I'm saying that because uh, I, it's something I noticed that in as much as most people, when you talk about epiphora, they directly run into nasal lacrimal duct obstruction. I was so shocked to realize when I came back from my training that most of the tearing that I see is not from nasal lacrimal duct obstruction. It, it is actually uh, because of punctal issues. And this is uh, my experience in Sub-Saharan Africa. These are uh, countries like Kenya. Uh, but if you go to places like Ethiopia, 
and uh, Somali and uh, Egypt, they have more nasolateral more duct obstruction than we see in this part of, of the world. And if you not nasolateral more, yes, nasolateral more obstruction. But for us, we see a lot of tearing from punctal issues, just the opposition of the punctum or punctal stenosis or obstruction of the punctum. So uh, rushing to try and approve an acylacrimal duct obstruction always will make you miss a pro, uh, major, uh, small problems like punctal issues are a little bit easier to deal with than um, the nasolacrimal duct issues. If there is an ectropion, you treat the ectropion, then definitely you deal with the, with the, with the issue. If it is a stenosis, you deal with the stenosis, then you have dealt with the, with the issue. Then after that is when you do uh, probing and syringing. Uh, you rightly said that we, I, I don't, if there's a test I don't like is a, a Jones Dye Disappearance Test. First of all, I, I, I never remember the steps of the Jones Dye Disappearance Test. Two, I've never come to know the importance of it because if you do what you call diagnostic probing, and that is the probing to make the diagnosis of the cause, and this is in an adult and a bigger person, that you should make that distinction. In adults and the bigger uh, and the grown up children, you do probing for diagnosis. In children, you do probing for management. And this, I'm, I'm, I, I'm insisting this because I see so many referrals. And then somebody recalls that we did probing, there's a patient who came with the epiphora, we did probing and syringing and there's no improvement. Then I want to call them and ask them, Why, what do you mean by there's no improvement? There was never going to be an improvement because probing and syringing in adults is diagnostic. When you say I did probing and syringing, the next thing I want you to tell me is this is where I found. Because when you do probing and syringing, then you get your result on the area of obstruction. So when you tell, I did this probing and syringing, the next question is, uh, I'll ask you is, then where is the obstruction? Because if it is the punctum, then the probe will not pass through. If it's the canalicula, or, or even the dilator will not go through. If it's a canalicula, the probe will not pass through and there will be a soft stop. And if you syringe, the fluid comes back through the same uh, pathway, okay? If it is, common canaliculi, there will be a soft stop and the fluid will come through the opposite punctum and it will be clear fluid. If it is the nasolacrimal duct, there will be a hard stop. And when you, you syringe, you will see reflux through the opposite punctum and it will be mucoid. And because of that, all, just that test and all can has told us everything about the obstruction. So you don't even need any disappearance test or anything else to prove. And even the radiological tests are more in experimental settings. So probing and syringing in this case will make you make uh, the proper diagnosis. So, uh, and that is my contribution in terms of the investigation of a patient with the nasolacrimal duct obstruction. Uh, I mean, with the PFORA, not, and that is, I, I tend also to make the same mistake to say every PFORA looks like a nasolacrimal duct obstruction. And that's why I don't like referrals. If somebody refers to me and say, there's a patient with the epiphora for this year, uh, it, 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 it irritates me sometimes because uh, it, makes, it makes, everybody assumes that all the epiphoras is from nasolacrimal duct obstruction. Upper, uh, upper lacrimal passages obstructions are more common in our setting than even the nasolacrimal duct obstruction itself. Then going to congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction, and because we are going to that, then uh, we have to look at the study because that is where it is. Uh, it's, 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 we, we are basing on it. First of all, I found this study very interesting. They are saying it's a landromized control trial, and they go ahead and report uh, one arm. The purpose of a RCT is to have a comparison arm. And that gives a very, very high power to a study because this is a study of uh, compared. Their comparison arm was supposed to be children who were syringed earlier than, I mean, who were done a probing, office probing at the time, uh, six to 10 months. Uh, and they totally didn't report anything about that. So that really draws a lot of strength out of the, the study because if you have done it as a RCT, 
the best you can do is report it as an RCT. That doesn't make, make, uh, make us not get any uh, inferences from the study. I, we can as well make some conclusions, but I would, uh, I would want, because as I understand, it's a major study, it's, it's part of a, a big, and uh, they have reported one arm of a bigger study. Uh, I don't understand the logic of their, their presentation, but we can still learn from them. First of all, let's go to what they did report. Uh, probing, uh, office probing in children with a nasolacrimal duct obstruction. Uh, that one I've never done myself, but I know there is a role of office probing in, especially in very young children who have very severe or severe cases of nasolacrimal duct obstruction and they are predisposed to dacrocystitis, or others actually have bilateral uh, dacrocils, which could be very big and interfere with the, with the breathing. Those are the ones you have to handle as an emergency and do office probing. Otherwise, it's not, a, it's, it's not a recommended thing. Office probing at six to eight months, I find it a little bit, I, I, I have never thought of doing it. Because the reasoning about office probing is that the children are not so big, there's no need to take them to theater because the risk of anesthesia is there, but it is still traumatic to the child. A child with six months will fight and you can see the kind of, uh, you, you can see like you're torturing them. So I have never even tried it uh, myself. Six, even more, even worse is 10 months. But as you have seen from the study, the, that is an exercise in futility because uh, most, most of these children were to get off how the P4 was to resolve uh, by itself in the first place. So they have just insisted on what we always knew that most of these cases of P4 will go away by themselves. Uh, and that is uh, and that is a practice. Uh, I, I, tend, I tend to say that there is no need of trying to probe children before the age of uh, one year, unless you have uh, a recurrent acrocystitis uh, that, that is one of the reasons that I would say that is, uh, is indicated. Or patients with the severe dark cells that look so solid, and there's no harm of taking them to theater because as you realize that anesthesia nowadays is not as, as bad as it used to be. The fear is uh, the risk of anesthesia of taking a child who is so young. If a child is six months, I don't fear anesthesia very much nowadays because the anesthetist, of course you have to choose a an anesthetist, I don't know whether you have clinical officer anesthetist, I don't, I don't go in in children with clinical officer anesthetist, I go with a doctor, a specialist anesthetist in children, especially if they, are, if they are young. And I'd rather do probing under general anesthesia. Uh, but having said that, uh, uh, of course, after one year, probing is the treatment of choice, uh, probing and syringe. And as you rightly said, 90% of children with congenital, 95 more or so with congenital lacerocrimal duct obstruction, with the massage only, the problem we resolve within one year. You are left with only 5%. More than 90%, again, of that 5%, we resolve after the first probing. And if you have done the first probing and it's not working, the second probing might not be as successful. Chances are that you are dealing with a bony obstruction. And that case is, 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 is you love to probably be more aggressive. In our setting, uh, the recommended thing to do is a balloon, uh, expansion with balloons, which we, in our settings, we don't have. Most of us, we tend to keep the children at least for conservative treatment with antibiotics on and off until they're three years of age. Uh, one of the things I'd like to say is that uh, there is one of the common things that I've seen that we have not seen in books. And I tend to think it's more like a stenosis. You will see uh, a child who has a uh, epiphora. The epiphora is more or less is, is on and off. The, when you press or you put pressure on the lacrimal sac, there is no reflux. Uh, most of these children, when you take them to theater and you syringe, you realize that the pathway is patent, but still they are symptomatic. These children, I tend to think they have a stenosis of the system. And some of the times, most of the times, if you ask about the history, you realize the epiphora is worse during upper respiratory tract infection. What that means is that they get a bit of edema at the tip of the nasolacrimal duct, 
uh, and then because of this, especially allergies and upper respiratory tract infections, and they get a piphora. And because of that, these children, if you probe, what you are trying to do, what you'll do is uh, traumatize the mucosa of the nasolacrimal duct. And because of that, you make the situation worse. So you have to choose your patients wisely. If you, for me personally, I've made it almost an habit. If a patient does not have a reflux on pressure of a lacrimal sac, what I call the ropeless, I don't probe them. I, they, I, I can encourage massage. I encourage uh, antibiotics in case of discharge, but I don't probe. And because of that, I have realized that I, I have, uh, my probing has reduced and my patients are happier. Because in most cases, if you explain to the patients what is, is going on and what is the case and what is the situation, they also choose not to, to have them uh, probed. So my probing is usually for patients who have a, a reflux on pressure of a lacrimal sac. Of course, if the epiphora is too much, then sometimes you can try to do that even if the pressure of a lacrimal sac is not okay. So it's very important to have that in mind uh, in these patients with the epiphora. The other thing about uh, a nasal lacrimal duct, especially this one is stenosis, they tend to have less uh, discharge. If you sit with the parents and explain to them, and I usually have a chat on my desk, or even sometimes if I, have, I don't have a chat, I easily Google the nasal lacrimal duct uh, system and explain to them what's going on. Most of these patients, especially who do not have a reflux, or don't have a lot of discharge, when you tell them what is going on, they never come back. Because the reason they keep coming back or going from hospital to hospital is they don't understand what is going on. They see the child is tearing throughout, they think there could be a major problem. And if you don't explain to them what is going on, then they keep moving from a doctor to doctor. Immediately you explain to them what's going on, they might, they might not even come back again because they understand the situation. So that is my, my take on, uh, on the subject. It is, it is a very important subject to, to discuss. I know most people don't like uh, P4 uh, tearing and they, they see those cases, they, they want to refer as soon as possible, but it's important to have an objective look into that. Uh, of course, the, then the question comes, when do you do a DCR? Uh, of course, you can't do a DCR when the child is, is, is the, the bony structures are not better. And um, in that case, most of the case delay up to at least uh, three years. Uh, endoscopic uh, DCR can be attempted even here uh, before, before three years of age. Uh, I don't think I have any other point, but uh, this is my contribution to the, to the topic. Unless somebody has a question. Yes, Fred, do you have a question? Or you want to say something on your presentation? I think uh, uh, he has elucidated whatever I wanted to ask also, because um, I, when I was passing through the presentation, I find that the other part of uh, the comparison wasn't there. It was a bit difficult to it was a bit a bit difficult to how to compare and to bring result and uh, some critiques because it was just one arm and that's why it was uh, it was uh, what I wanted to brought up and the other thing it was uh, what uh, Dr. Nyeza raised it was um, about the practice in practice what to do and he has mentioned everything I think we will take it into account and uh, we are going to try also to put it into practice I think is what I wanted to to say. Yes, thank you very much. I was, un I was wondering, Dr. Nyenze, uh, I have a number of patients uh, uh, who have had uh, this um, uh, chronic discharge. It goes on and on and off. And during uh, that period, the patient uh, have encouraged the parents to continue doing the, the massaging. So uh, how long? Uh, uh, during this period, uh, like uh, like what you have been given, like six months or up to one year before you can um, intervene surgically, 
would you want to be giving antibiotics? And do you, do you maintain the same type of, of, of uh, antibiotics? Yeah, in, uh, in view of um, having resistance or any side effects that these drugs may have. And especially that the parents are usually very, they are, they are really not willing that uh, they should continue giving antibiotics for this period of time. Yes, you are right. The biggest problem we get is, is they are the ones who keep coming back are the ones who have a discharge. And uh, the, the, the issue is, uh, for how long are you going to put, uh, how, how, how long are they going to use the, the antibiotic drops? Uh, what I usually do is, is to do it, even if it's the same type of antibiotic, uh, to do it on and off. Because most of the cases when you do antibiotics for uh, like five days, they're able to get a break for several, several weeks before it comes back. Uh, most of the antibiotics are safe because the absorption is not high. But uh, those are the, ch some, some children we consider probing, as I said, earlier than one year, especially if the discharge is, is, quite, a, is quite a bother. Uh, I've, I've done, the earliest I've done is eight months. And as I told you, it is, I usually do all of them under general anesthesia. There are some who can be very, very problematic. There's no problem, there's no harm. Uh, one thing you should realize, um, if, if the AP4, especially the ones with severe discharge, after six months, chances are that it's not going to go away up to the rest of the year. Most of the spontaneous recoveries happen before six months. And something you will also notice. Thank you very much. Now that you have you mentioned one of the indications for the AD surgical intervention, are there any other indications in your practice that you use? Are there other indications for for AD surgical interventions? Yes. No. Uh, early surgical intervention is 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 especially the cholecystitis, and if it is uh, recurrent, and of course I mentioned the uh, dacrocils when are big, uh, sometimes they can even cause a difficulty in breathing when they are bilateral. So those are the cases that we could uh, consider early uh, surgical intervention, but most of the cases we we don't. Okay, can we have any contributions? We still have a bit of a few minutes. We started a little bit late. So one or two minutes before we close, uh, Dr. Ngandwe. As, as Dr. Ngandwe is coming to make a comment, I was wondering in this study, normally um, even in textbooks, they, they encourage that you do the massaging four times a day. But in this study, we noticed that they were doing uh, BD. I was wondering why that is so. And still, we still had um, the significant um, resolution. Would you, would you still, would you encourage us, um, you know, like four, four times a day sometimes can be so bothersome to the parents. It's two, it's two times a day, is there evidence enough? Why, why, for example, we do four times a day as compared to, as opposed to two times a day? Uh, I really don't, don't have a major basis about when you, why do you do four times or two times a day? Uh, I personally, I recommend only twice a day. Uh, more so because uh, of, of, of the, the discomfort of the massage. You realize that once you start doing the massage, the children do not want even you to put your hand close to their face. So it becomes a little bit uh, tricky to do. Uh, if it's done well, you know, this massage is not about frequency or anything. This massage is, is, is just putting pressure on the sac and pushing the fluid down. So even one massage, sometimes when, you know, even when, if, if you try to observe what the parents do when they are doing massage, you realize most patients, patients don't do any massage. So even when they come to the clinic, and this is what the most important thing you should also notice, is that uh, try to do, as you demonstrate, as you, as you demonstrate, uh, sometimes you actually just open the sack yourself. They come to your clinic and as you are demonstrating, because that time the sack is totally full, you put pressure on it, sometimes the membrane is so thin. They just go home and they never see the problem again. So even one massage when it's done well, it works very, 
it, it, it works very well. So it's not usually about frequency, but it is usually about how do you do the lacrimal, uh, how do you do the, the massage. But I usually just go for twice a day. Yes, Dr. Nganu, you have anything to say? Um, thank you so much, Dr. Mumbi. Thank you to the presenters. It's been quite uh, a very good presentation. And um, I think, uh, for me, it just reminds me of one of the cases that we, we had uh, of a child who presented with Epiphora. And um, I think uh, what we discovered in our patient was that the child actually had uh, uh, a nasal lacrimal uh, cutaneous uh, fistula, fistula. So um, um, I'm not too sure, uh, Dr. Nienz, whether in your practice uh, you have had many children uh, presenting with um, like remo cutaneous uh, fistula and maybe what you've been doing uh, in case of uh, such children. Uh, well, thank you for that question. Uh, I, I, they are not, I've not seen many of them, uh, the, the fistula themselves. Uh, th that can be a bit uh, of a complicated uh, problem. Sometimes the fistula, uh, it, it depends on where it is coming. Sometimes the fistula does not come from the lacrimal sac itself, it comes from the canaliculi. That is even worse uh, to manage. But others, the fistula comes from the lacrimal sac itself and you'll see tears coming out of it. The, there are two types of fistulas. Some is a congenital fistula and the other one is a fistula which comes after adacrocystitis. Uh, the commonest, the commonest fistula is the one that comes after dacrocystitis, and that is, I would say, the best fistula again to manage, because it means the lacrimal sac is there and it's well done, it's it's, it's well developed, but it has a fistula. So this one, uh, if you do a when you're doing a DCR, when you do a proper DCR, then you do a fistulectomy, then that that problem is sorted for forever. The congenital one, it is now where it is, is a tricky one because sometimes you'll find even the lacrimal sac itself is not well developed. So it becomes even very difficult to do a DCR. If, if the lacrimal sac is developed and you push water, you can see it swelling a bit uh, before, before it, 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 it passes through the fistula. That is still okay. You can always do a DCR and do a fistulectomy. But the congenital one where the, the, the lacrimal sac is almost missing, there's the just tears coming through, that one is a very tricky one. And sometimes you might have just to, to block the fistula and let the tearing come from the eye because it's, it's, it's tricky to see uh, a fistula uh, tears coming from there. And then and the child is bigger. If the child is bigger, then a Jones tube uh, can be done in that case. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Unless there's any, any question, we have run out of time. We'd like to thank you, the presenter, Dr. Fred. Uh, thank you very much for putting in a, in a lot. He was supposed to be presented uh, some time back. Unfortunately, he had a funeral, so we pushed this. We are fortunate enough that he has been able to. And then also, fortunately, um, having informed Dr. Nienze uh, from that time, he still managed to stay with us. We would like to thank you, Dr. Nienze, for sparing time. And we hope to call upon you on other topics. Uh, so we do different type of topics randomly. We don't have a system. So we can have a topic from plastics, from cornea, from retina, whichever area, including public health. So we hope next time that you'll be able to join us. Um, we are just um, waiting also to have, um, uh, on 23rd, uh, we're just confirming we're going to have uh, a seminar, a short seminar on um, in a neuro ophthalmology. So we we'll have uh, in the present the neurologist team locally and also neuroradiologists around. So we hope you can also join us um, and uh, have, have your input. Cool. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and thank you for considering to uh, to invite me. It's to, uh, I'm always available and uh, we can always, uh, I, I will, if I get time, I'll be joining. Thank you so much and I appreciate uh, uh, your colleagues from Zambia for hosting me.
and uh, uh, we, we look forward for even more presentation and more discussions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, and thank you everyone for finding time and joining. We still encourage the colleagues, especially the host. I can see the number of them in the background, so it means you connected using one uh, one um, the platform. Thank you very much, everyone, and see you next week. Thank. You.